Oh, okay. So the key materials that you need for application. Um, again, this information is all available on the website. So this is just um, meant to be an overview to help you get your bearings as to what documents you might need. Uh, you need to provide the personal statements. There are two personal statements for the application. <clears throat> the first one is a basically a statement of purpose as to why you are applying to the program um, and how it fits into your general career goals. Um, the full details, again, are available on the website. And the second personal statement is an analysis of a legal problem. Both of these documents are short, um, so you'll be... Um, you'll want to keep your statements brief within the word limit provided um, on the application. Um, you'll also need to provide academic transcripts and your, um, your diploma or certificate of graduation from your university or law school if you've graduated from a law school already. Um, there is a resume that uh, will be prepared in, a form, in the form provided by KO. Uh, we request a letter of recommendation. Um, we say that we, we need at least one, um, but no more than two. So you can have one or two. Um, and we request that the letter be from somebody, you have at least one letter from somebody who has um, served as your academic advisor or who has taught one of your uh, courses and knows you well from that context in an academic setting. We also require a proof of English proficiency. But uh, there is an exemption available for that, uh, which I will discuss uh, in more detail. We don't have a hard cutoff for a specific score that you need to demonstrate um, that you have sufficient English. So we request, we recommend that applicants take the TOEFL or IELTS test. Um, we do also accept TOEIC. Um, and again, we don't have any score cutoff, um, but we do need to see proof of proficiency unless you are exempt. Um, and again, I'll explain that um, in a moment. These documents, generally speaking, can be submitted digitally. So we have an online application system and you can submit most of them that way. Some originals um, may be required to be mailed, such as original transcripts or, um, I mean, typically it's, it's original transcripts that we could change from time to time. So it's important to confirm based on your review of the instructions, um, which documents can be submitted online and which documents must be submitted um, in original or can be submitted online first with originals to follow. Okay, um, and there are some other documents that are required. Those are the big ones that I just explained, but there are a few more. So again, check the application guidebook for details. The application schedule uh, is also quite important. So as I mentioned, we have these two matriculation periods. There is a very detailed schedule in the application guidebook. Let me see if I can hold this up to my camera and not have the, um, the screen blurred out. Oh well, it's not, uh, it's not working very well. Sorry about that. There is a, here, yeah, this, um, yeah, you can see that there's this chart here. Um, and the chart um, explains exactly what the eligible period for submission of each document is during each application period. So the first application period, the very first document, um, if you require it, which is an English proficiency test exemption, um, will be submittable from April 11th, so that's next week, next Monday, until April 15th, next Friday. Um, so the, the periods are starting soon and it provides the specific dates for each document that you need. So it's very helpful. Um, I should say each document or each part of the process, some of the parts of the process include a number of documents um, in a bundle. Anyway, it's a clear explanation of what you need to provide at what time. Okay, um, so I mentioned before that there are two, um, there are a couple potential documents that may be required to be submitted before the general application entry period. And those documents are the application for English proficiency test exemption and the application for eligibility certification. Neither of these documents is required for every applicant. They are basically optional documents. So the application um, period for English proficiency test exemption, you may be 
um, eligible for an exemption from the English proficiency test. Um, for example, if you have attended um, university where all of your classes were in English, um, or if you grew up in a English speaking country, um, so your education has been in English, you may be eligible for an exemption. There are more details about that in the application guidebook. Um, similarly, the uh, application eligibility certification. Generally speaking, um, we require that all applicants to the program have either an undergraduate degree in law or a Juris Doctor degree. However, um, if you have knowledge that is equivalent to an undergraduate degree in law, so for example, if um, in Japan, for example, there are many people who work in the in-house legal department of a company. And if you've been working in the in-house legal department of a company for five years, um, even though you don't have an undergraduate degree in law, you may nonetheless be eligible to apply for the program. Five years is not a specific number. That's just an example. Um, you may nonetheless be eligible to apply to the LM program, um, but we don't want you to have to submit all of your documents, not even knowing if you're eligible. So um, you can submit an application for certification of eligibility. And then in that case, we will review in advance um, and let you know if we believe you are eligible to apply or not. If you submit the application um, for certification of eligibility within the um, deadline. And that begins uh, the week after next. The first time you can submit that document is April 18th. Um, also, some people, for example, if you're a licensed um, patent lawyer in a country that has a separate license for patent lawyers, that may be another case where you would like to submit an application for certification of eligibility to make sure that you're eligible for the program before you go to the trouble of applying. We try to make it um, you know, as easy as possible for you so that you don't have to spend uh, extra time and resources getting an application together without knowing if you're eligible. Okay, um, as far as the application process goes, and so again, those two documents are due before the start of the regular application period. So please keep that in mind and take a look at the schedule that is available on the uh, KO LLM website. Um, lastly, as far as uh, geographic jurisdiction, um, you know, the, the places from which we've had students apply and accept students, we've had students from all over the world, uh, from North and South America, Europe, Africa, Northeast Asia, South, Southeast Asia, and South Asia. And we encourage students to apply from all um, geographies. So if you're interested in the program, uh, please do um, let us know and, and please apply. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mamal Sheridan. Next, Professor Litt, who is the head of LLM Academic Affairs Committee, will explain about the curriculum for LLM program. Um, great. Thank you, Murakami-san. Uh, thank you, Reed. Um, I've just put in the chat the, the website that Reed is talking about, the public website. Um, if you Google KO LLM, I think this is what comes up. Um, and since most Thank of the things I'm going to be talking about as well, you can find on the website. Um, I want to, um, uh, you can, if you're at your computer, you can access it now um, or you can sit, try it later. Um, we have a, the, the, the LLM program is called the LLM in Global Legal Practice, which is a pretty, any anytime you hear the term global, um, it's, it's a term Japanese like. Um, uh, so it shows up sometimes in, in our um, subject, in our, in our categories for courses. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a, it's a broad um, menu of, of courses that we have. Um, we have courses in private international law, business law, IP. We've got public international law. Uh, we have a fair amount of comparative study. Um, we have a lot of courses that are um, focused on practice, legal practice, um, and that's, you know, the purpose of the Japanese law schools. Um, when they were, the, the Jap Japan has had, uh, you know, law faculties in their universities for well over 100 years, um, uh, but the law schools were set up, and, and uh, we are the KO Law School, Okay, also has a law faculty, people, uh, faculty cross-teach between the, the law school and the law faculty, but 
um, the law school uh, was set up um, to train lawyers, train practitioners who were going to take the Japanese bar and become lawyers, prosecutors, and judges. Um, that's the primary purpose of the law school, um, as it is in, um, you know, a, a US or UK or Australian law school, um, basically. Um, but of course, it also has a, um, a broader purpose of, of, of law as an academic area of study um, uh, and law, looking at uh, public international law, looking at uh, uh, legal theory, legal philosophy, um, of course, as well. Um, and you see, see all of that reflected in our curriculum. Um, if you want to look, if you look at the tab course list catalog, um, it has the current list of courses um, and, and the current categories. Um, you can see Japanese law and Asian law in a global practi practical perspective. Second category is business law, which is a very broad category, of course. Um, third is global security and law, which is, is really more public international law. Um, and fourth is innovations and intellectual property law. Uh, which is what it sounds like. Then we have area studies. Um, many of the, particularly the exchange students and students from outside of Asia who are coming to study in Japan want to study, um, uh, you know, want to study Japanese law or want to study um, the laws of other Asian countries. And many of the Japanese students want also want to study laws of other Asian countries. Um, comparative law, Japan has a very rich uh, tradition of comparative law, um, partly because of the history of the country as a late modernizing um, uh, economy, where uh, Japan was sort of forced into the the, um, the modern world in the Meiji period and needed to very quickly um, engage in a comparison of legal systems and pick and choose among them. Um, and Japan has continued to do that very well. So there's a uh, comparative law comes naturally um, to people, to legal scholars in Japan. And then we have a um, current legal issues category, um, which uh, you, is, you can see has a number of things in there, some of which you could probably fit in other categories, but this uh, is a, it's a way for us to offer courses, um, these things called seminar current legal issues. It's a, it's a way that we can um, avoid some of the bureaucracy when we want to um, set up a new course, basically, that someone suggests and we want to offer it, we have someone to teach it, it sounds like a great topic and we want to try it, we can put it in that category. Um, legal research and writing um, is what it sounds like. Um, and then practical training. Again, this, you can see we have a lot of practical training courses. Um, and for some of the, I think for business law and international dispute resolution, um, if I remember correctly, for the certificates in those areas, you need to take at least one practical training course in that area. And I think most people take, um, there are two credits, one is usually one course. I think most people take more than one um, in those areas. Um, it, we, we see that, you know, in some other universities around the world, they have um, very specialized LLM programs. Um, and KO, um, again, because of the way that Japanese universities are regulated, um, for each program that you have, you need to dedicate faculty, administrative staff, all of this. So it's not really practical for us to have five LLM programs. Um, we have a double degree arrangement with the University of Washington, for example, and they have five LLM programs or, or more. And so you can get an LLM in health law or in, um, in development law um, or in, uh, in, in business law. Um, so, but um, for the, again, regulatory and bureaucratic reasons, um, what we've done instead is we've set up a system of certificates. Um, there's another tab um, discussing the certificates um, in the, uh, on the website. And uh, the idea is that if you're going to focus your studies in the LLM program in a particular area of practice, um, that you can get the university to recognize that 
and hopefully that makes your degree more marketable. If you if you are a, a young lawyer and you want to specialize in international dispute resolution, you would like to do um, uh, international commercial arbitration and focus on that. The reason you're going to the LLM program is to take the many courses we have that provide training in that area. Uh, then instead of getting an LLM in global legal practice, you would like to get also a certificate in international dispute resolution. Um, you also might want to, um, our, our program also allows you to become a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, uh, CIARB, um, as well. Um, so we're trying to um, respond to the needs of, this, of our students that the, the legal profession is becoming more and more specialized. <laughs> um, it's hard to go out and get clients by just saying, I'm a lawyer, I can do anything. Oh, you need a will um, or you have an, a trust in the state matter, I can do that. You have a divorce, I can do that. You need it, you, you wanna buy a company, I can do that. That's not very effective as a, as a way to um, build a practice in this day and age. Um, so, um, so we want to make sure that um, that people can specialize. Um, the certificates are in five areas. Um, we've established them gradually over time as we've made sure that we have sort of critical mass and that there are plenty of courses available and that we have someone on the faculty who is basically looking after the area. I, I don't think they're officially in charge of, of the particular area, but we do have um, unofficial people um, uh, looking after each of these areas. Uh, the first one is in business law, uh, which is, again, um, a very broad area. It could cover anything from uh, antitrust and competition law to, um, to mergers and acquisitions, to um, finance, securities, all sorts of things. Um, the second is international dispute resolution. Uh, which again, the, because we're an, because of the international in international dispute resolution, a lot of the focus is on cross-border litigation, but but even more so on arbitration, um, uh, international commercial arbitration, investment arbitration, uh, and um, we have uh, practice classes as well where you get to uh, do mock arbitrations, uh, for example. Um, then we have uh, a certificate in Japanese law. Um, one of the benefits of uh, being at Keio is that we have this, um, you know, huge and very talented group of, of Japanese faculty who, who are leaders in their fields. Uh, Keio has um, most years the most successful applicants for the Japanese bar out of any of the, the Japanese law schools. And so, um, uh, we're very fortunate that we can take advantage of um, the expertise in Japanese law. Um, and I think we've gradually, again, built up. Uh, when, when the program first started, there were some people who weren't sure that they even had enough materials to teach a course in their area of specialization in English um, because they had never done it. But um, I think that... Um, in, for the most part, we've seen that there's there's no barrier at all. That there um, there is a lot that's been um, researched and and written about um, areas of Japanese law in English, so we can offer um, a full curriculum in that area. Uh, law and development in Asia. Um, Matsuo Sensei, who who just um, introduced the program, who's the director of the program right now, is. Um, the informal leader of this area and leader of our um, efforts uh, to focus on um, law and development in Asia. He teaches several courses in this area, and we've had um, very close relationships um, through through a program that Matsuo Sensei has has led with a, a number of law schools in Southeast Asia, um, in the Mekong Delta region, uh, and we have a number of students, uh, excellent students we've gotten from uh, from those countries um, on a regular basis uh, to come into our program, um, who uh, I certainly enjoy um, enjoy having them in, in the classroom. Um, and uh, we've also, pre-pandemic, we had a number of opportunities to, uh, for students to go and do um, internships or, or joint classes or things like that in um, in Vietnam and Cambodia, I believe. Um, 
uh, and hopefully we'll have opportunities like that again in the future. Uh, and lastly, last but not least, is intellectual property law. Um, this is a very popular area. Um, we have uh, we've had plenty of people who are um, either patent attorneys or in-house counsel who are focused on intellectual property law, um, and uh, who have um, who've taken the certificate in this area. Again, it's an area where specialization is very important. Um, Toshiko Takenaka, one of our faculty members, um, splits her year between uh, KO in the spring and the University of Washington um, in sort of fall winter. So um, she's uh, both very important as a um, tying us to that um, partner university, but also um, in leading our intellectual property offerings in the spring. In the fall, we have a number of other, um, uh, we have some adjunct instructors. We have um, Yuko Kimijima, who's in the law faculty who teaches. And we also have an exchange agreement with Waseda, um, which has its own um, intellectual property program so that our students can take some of their courses in the fall and they can take some of our courses in the spring. Um, so that's, um, that's the certificates. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've been, I, I've had students um, who come to the program with something particularly in mind that they want to focus on. Um, for the most part, um, when you talk to them when they're leaving, um, or after they leave, um, they've had plenty of flexibility to actually um, achieve um, achieve their goal. Um, I know I had this, a student who was had previously worked in an international human rights organization and uh, wanted to focus on those types of issues and um, was very glad um, she took one of my um, business law and compliance related classes and she wrote a great paper about um, an issue involving, um, you know, mineral extraction, oil extraction in Africa, uh, where a multinational um, major uh, oil company has run into all sorts of problems um, through its conduct over over decades, um, and that has ended up in court. Um, and it's a it's a you know it's a good business law topic, but it also fit her particular interest, um, and uh, she was able to write her fin final paper on that as as an example. So I'm um, happy to answer any questions you have at the end of the session. And uh, thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Lit. Next, uh, Professor Tanigawa, who is the member of LLM Admission Committee, will give a short remarks. All right, uh, thank you very much, Makan um, san, and uh, uh, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for uh, attending this session. Uh, you know, some of you may have uh, uh, you know, some difficulties in, in adjusting, uh, you know, time difference, uh, but I really appreciate uh, your interest in uh, our, our school. Um, my name is Tatsuya Tanigawa. Um, uh, I'm a professor uh, at Keo Law School, but uh, uh, my, my main uh, job is a lawyer, uh, as a practitioner. Um, today, I just uh, wanted to uh, emphasize uh, uh, our, our uh, strong points uh, of, uh, of our you know, practical uh, practitioner's perspective in this law school. Um, I work for uh, uh, you know Nishimura and Asahi, which is a you know uh, one of the largest uh, Japanese law firms in Japan, and uh, not only myself but also many of my colleagues uh, teach uh, at uh, Keio Law School, and uh, I teach like a merger liquidation, any kind of corporate uh, related issues. And uh, some of my colleagues teach tax, some teach uh, like a bankruptcy, bankruptcy law, some teach uh, finance law. So you will, you will uh, have opportunities to learn uh, you know, various uh, aspects of uh, you know, practice. And then you know, uh, if, if, you, if you have learned any academic uh, legal issues, probably uh, you will realize after the graduation that the, 
just a learning academic issue uh, is not complete for 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 uh, for real world and uh, so uh, we are trying to gap a uh, bridge the gap between the uh, academic uh, world and the uh, practitioner's world so uh, at uh, Keolo school you will be able to have such a great opportunity to learn such, uh, you know, practitioner's perspective. And uh, I'm a lawyer, but uh, you will also have uh, many uh, former prosecutors and the judges as well. So um, you will be enjoy such uh, very good opportunities. And uh, also, uh, I just want to emphasize that uh, due to the size of our law school, you know, you 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 will have very close act close access to uh, many of fa faculty members. So you, you, if you have any kind of questions or you, if you want to uh, only chat with us, you, you know, it's, it's quite easy. So, you know, we are, uh, you are welcome to such communications anytime. So uh, I hope uh, you will be, uh, you will keep your interest in our law school and uh, uh, despite of this uh, pandemic situation, uh, I really hope you uh, see all see you all very soon. Right. Uh, thank you very much, everyone.